And you should all be here for what is photogrammetry. Yeah, I'm not going to that either. <laughs> <laughs> Good enough. Uh, the session will take roughly about an hour with uh, Q&A. And uh, I'd like to welcome Nick Grandley. Gandley? Oh, uh, Grandley. Gan Grandley. All right, what you that. <laughs> he is a registered architect with a passion for architectural photography and social media. So I'd like to now hand over the time to Nick. OK, cheers. Thanks, everyone. Uh, so anybody here use some of the 3D modeling tools for photos? Ready? SketchUp? Yeah, SketchUp. Yes. So um, I guess I'll just elaborate a little bit of what I've been doing and why I've been asked to do this. So up until about three years ago, I was working in BIM a lot. Um, all, all sorts of projects. And then I took a complete leave of absence and just left architecture and ended up doing architectural photography. And that's what I do now. Um, so one of the organisers said, well, can you come and play with this new software, the Recap software, which Autodesk is offering for free, and sort of evaluate it partly from a bit perspective, but also from a photography perspective. And so I've started off with zero knowledge on this subject at all and had to figure out how it works and sort of trying to think about it as a practical level, can you use this as a tool, or is it more sort of a gimmick at the moment? So we're going to break this session up into two main parts. Um, the second part, what I've done is, while I was in Melbourne, I roamed around and just tried to photograph different subjects and objects to see where it failed, which was most of the time. But it's kind of fun to see where it was failing and to see where the opportunities are coming. So it's obvious that this is really powerful. It's just whether or not you'd actually use this in your own models. But what we're going to start off with is, I thought it would be really fun to actually, oh, hello, how are you? Um, to actually start off with a model ourselves. So I thought we could actually model this room with all of us in it and see what the outcome would be. We do this first up because it's going to take a little bit of time once we upload the photos and once we uh, let it process. So how does that all sound? Everyone like to be photographed? Okay, so part of this is I need you all to make sure there's enough room for me to move around on the outside. Yep, so there's a nice gap. And wherever you are, you've got to stay. Because we're going to take a lot of photos to try and create a 3D model of ourselves, which we can then play with, and then import it. So is everyone happy? Do you want to have a seat as well? Sure. Yeah, do you have a seat? And you can choose any pose you want. You know, maybe you want to cross your legs and put your hands over there and look very elegant. Um, whatever you can hold is probably going to take about probably about five minutes. Hi. Right. Just missed that intro, but if you want to grab a seat, and then you've got to stay still for about five minutes. We can, yeah. One, one, yeah, it's fine. It's, it's, it's warm. Yeah. Um, we're just going to do this exercise. So for the next five minutes, nobody else can come in. But after that, you know, I can work um, So nobody's ever used Recap or any of this software before? Okay. You used it? Okay. So the way it works is that you need to take a series of photos of the subject and then you upload it to Autodesk's cloud service, Autodesk 360, and it does the processing. So there's different ways that you photograph it when compared to, let's say, a small standalone subject to an interior subject. So we're going to start off with a, the interior. And let me just swap over to this super elegant diagram. So what we need to do is, if we imagine this is an interior, we need to get a photograph of about every 5 to 10 degrees. So it's a lot of different photos. And what we're trying to do is collect as much data as we can for our images. And we'll see where that sort of works and where it doesn't work. So I'm going to start off in the corner. Anybody particularly interested in the camera settings? Anyone do a lot of photography, anything like that? A little bit? So all I'm doing right now is I'm using a manual settings so that my exposure isn't changing. So I've got a fixed exposure for the shot. And I'm using Aperture 11 so that I've got a large depth of field. Anybody know what that means? Yeah. Yeah, so basically I'm trying to get as much in focus as possible. And I'm on a tripod, obviously, to keep things stable. You don't need all of this stuff. It's just out of habit from photography, I might as well take a good shot rather than taking an average shot. I'm also shooting at a low quality image. 
just so that it's faster, so that we can upload to the cloud a little bit you know, faster. Otherwise, we may lose the. Uh, we may not have enough time. I'm using a wide-angle lens, I'm trying to get as much information in as possible. During the test, what I realised was if you try and use a zoom or anything like that, it's so hard to capture the image or enough information about it. So I'm using a super wide angle. Uh, I'm just, this is a tilt shift lens. Again, you don't need to use any of this stuff, but it just, it does help um, being able to capture multiple areas of the, the scene. Does so that I'm, account for the, the distortion of the wide angle lens? Uh, it didn't seem to matter. I was interested in that too. And I tested it with, this is a 17 mil lens. I also tested it on a uh, 24 to 105, which is obviously it's less wide, more of a zoom lens. And it didn't seem to matter. What mattered was, I think it needs to be consistent, that makes sense in my head. Um, and you need to capture as much of the space as you can. So what happens when you focus on a zoom shot, I'm only maybe capturing that much of the scene. Well, for that to work, I need to have like a 40% overlap. So I end up having to have so many shots, it's not reasonable. And it turned out that um, in the Autodesk video, it sort of suggests that you can just grab your iPhone and go click, 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 and make sort of a panorama. But that doesn't work because you're limited to about 250 photos for your model. So you end up, and you miss bits, because you can't tell what you've captured. It's not smart enough to do that. So let's get started. I'm just going to focus somewhere in the room and try and do this as quickly as possible. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a double shot for each angle. And the reason I'm doing that is I'm going to photograph that top bit and the bottom bit, because I can't see all of the room. Does that make sense? OK. So bear with me. I'm going to try and talk as I do this as we go around. So I've taken two shots, that's done. I'm going to take a one step motion and I'm only doing this, I'm doing this because I've sort of guessed that at about 10 degrees I need to shoot at every metre in this room. So everybody stay still and you're all going to blur a little bit anyway. It's not going to model you perfectly I don't think. Although it's always a Experiment. Now, let's see what's happening. The yeah, projector's not too bright. Now, on the screen behind me, I've given you a link. Um, no, I haven't. <laughs> I've given you a link down here if you want to play yeah, with the model yourself. Well. No, it's alright. It's, really it's very bright, but we'll see if it works. Uh, so if you want to play with any of the models yourself, you can follow that link and we'll take you over there. One metre step again. And I've also put up their Twitter hashtags. Anybody use Twitter in the room? No. Wow, not a single person. That's amazing. Too, too old. We're afraid to raise our hands. <laughs> Try not to move. Okay. And you can see that I'm not having to be perfectly accurate. It doesn't appear to. It's actually very smart in how it seems to stitch everything together. And I'm guessing what it's trying to do is look for contrast in the image and create lines. And then figure out where those lines all match up. Because after it, after it uh, creates your model, you can actually press a button and it will show you all the camera angles. As you can see, all I'm doing is I'm centering on the room and I'm following the instructions which are provided by Autodesk. There's a great video which I'll put in the notes for this talk. And they, they illustrate or they go through the process of how, how to do it pretty simply. thing with this is 
I can't tell what I've captured in my photography and what I haven't because you're obviously not using a smartphone or a program to figure out what's being captured. We're playing with, what is it, the Nexus? Yeah. And um, the Nexus, when it does its panoramas, seems to have this really cool API where it's got a little dot showing you what you haven't taken in your panorama yet. And if you had that for this modeling, it would make it so much easier because rather than guessing what I've captured and what I haven't, it would uh, show me. This is the most quiet talk for the day. Um, exposure wise, like I'm just taking these shots. <coughs> like that last shot, everybody was in black. So I doubt that will be usable by the software. And it's one of the limitations <coughs> I think, of using a camera to be able to try and model something. Because you can only capture the data that your camera can capture. And cameras have a limitation on where they're black point is and where their white point is. And so if you're dealing with high contrast subjects, you'll probably struggle to be able to capture enough information. Anybody familiar with dynamic range? <laughs> uh, dynamic range is how much, uh, how much data basically your camera can capture between blacks and whites. And the more money you spend on a camera, the more it can capture. But ultimately, your JPEG is limited by um, the number of bits of information it can carry. And that seems to be the real limitation of using photos to model something. Because it's not actually measuring distance to objects. It's simply measuring the, uh, the reflective luminosity. I think that's the right term basically how much light is bouncing off any object. But what it does do is it creates these beautiful maps on all the models because it's got all this data about what's in there. Anybody used any of the laser modeling software? Could um, somebody just tap on that little screen at the front? Um, just the little screen for the projected substance system. What do you want? Just tap it, it should turn back on. Or is it the computer that's turned off? I think it's probably the screen, yeah. Yep, cool. There's apparently an open source version of the main scanning software. Oh yeah. So what do you you have to buy special equipment for the laser itself? Uh, there have been a couple of instructables showing uh, using a beam splitter and a rotating table to scan objects, but not small objects. So after we do this, I've got a whole series of models where it seems to make far more sense and where it doesn't. But on small objects, it performed really well. So when you can uh, for example, I used a box brownie camera, little box. Anyone familiar with those things? Tiny little box, did a beautiful model. Uh, but strangely enough, trying to do it with a cup, like a perfectly round cup, I just freaked out because all the edges are exactly the same. It doesn't know where the um, doesn't know where or what the object is. It just thinks the photo is the same photo over and over. And it also doesn't seem to work with shiny materials. And this is stated in the uh, Autodesk video. Glass is another one. Glass just freaks out because it's dealing with so much more information there and it doesn't know what to do with the transparency. That image up on the screen, Nick, is, is you doing exactly the same process. Yep. And the white spots are the data that they you can't. Yeah, so this is fed square. So yeah. that's all the triangles with all the glass and and then basically what's happened is for whatever reason it can't see what's in the, um, in the corner there. So it hasn't mapped it, even though you've sort of probably was photographed, but the photograph was so far away because I was on the other side of the building, 
it just sort of bleeds it out. And that's what's hard because you can't tell what you've really captured or not because it's, there's no feedback. And you can't go back and take more photos? No, you can add more photos. Um, but just as a process, it's kind of hard if you think it practically. You so I want to go model, but you can all stop now. You can shake and relax. Um, if you think about that process of sending somebody to a site to model something specifically, they go photograph it, so they probably spend a couple of hours doing that. Then they come back, then they go through the modeling process, and then they find out they missed something. Then you send them back, they try and take some more photos of it. <coughs> you hope that works, send them back. It's just a, it's a lot of work. And then you've got to ask yourself how accurate that model is. Yeah. So why are you doing it? And so for, my conclusion here was, it's not this amazing tool to walk into a room and suddenly map it. It's more like there's specific things which are difficult to model, like sculptures, that you might want to include in your model, if that makes sense. So I've got those photos. I'm going to now plug them in here. And we're going to jump over to how does the change of light uh, affect the modeling? For example, in here we have pretty much regular light for the last 10 minutes, but in some places, depending on what kind of weather you've got, light will change quite dramatically during the photograph. Yeah, shadows. Was... I've, uh, I've got an example there of an external sculpture, and it was sort of the clouds were changing, I was worried about it. It doesn't seem to matter. I'm not sure, but it sort of does. It sort of, when it maps the model, it maps the shadows onto it as well. But I think what it's actually doing is it's trying to turn a light measurement, because what cameras do is measure light, and then trying to turn it into 3D data. So the 3D data seems to be okay, but how it maps it may be kind of weird. So does it measure the black and the white, or does it measure the colour? Um, or both? I, I don't know how it works in the back end. My guess is. What it's doing is looking for the contrast between pixels. Yeah. So, because they Photoshop does this all the time, um, it says there's a line, and then trying to f match those lines, yeah. and somehow it works back and figures out where the photo was taken from, and then tries to create a model of what it can. Um, okay, so what I've got here, I've got, I'm in Autodesk 360. Has anybody used this before? It's basically a cloud service. I'll just go back to the home page here. It's free to sign up for, you get five gigs. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to upload these photos. You just upload it to a folder. And I've got a bin day out. And you go upload. So documents. And here's our photos. And I think that's all of them. So that's going to sit there probably for you know, 10 minutes, depending on how fast the internet is here, as it uploads those files. So what we can do now is we can jump over to some of these other models and see where it performed well and where it sort of failed. Let me... So the, let's jump over to the box branding, because this one was a success. This one was pretty cool. So here you can see the different photos of the box ground. So you imagine it's in front of you. You roam around in the same way, taking photo every five to 10 degrees. Then what you do is you select, you select all those images. And the process is really as easy as just going to create 3D models and it does much of the rest. So the process is super easy. It's got a few things to ask you about how many, um, uh, how detailed you want to be and a few things like that, but it's pretty straightforward. And what you end up with is this online model and it gives you a few different formats. Uh, there's an object format uh, or OBJ and a couple others. So let's, and as you can see, it takes a little bit of time to load up this model. You can share these publicly. So on that link that was up on the screen before, you can go play with these anytime you want. You can share with your clients. But again, it's not doesn't really seem to be uh, 
something where you photograph something which you share directly, it's more like I need to model something which is really difficult. I'm going to model that, then I'm going to import that, slice it, cut it, clean it up, and then use that in my models just to basically to give you more accuracy. And so this is the model in on the web. And as you can see, it's modeled the floor as well. And it's got a few weird things, because this is the first one that I did, and if we zoom up, what you can see is just underneath the strap, because I was shooting from above, there's no shots which show that that's actually going straight through. So with a bit of practice, you could probably make that better, but it's hard to do because you don't know what you're photographing as you go. But model-wise, I mean, all the little bits here of all the, the components, it's pretty impressive what it's gotten out of those photos. Uh, again, on the, the ground itself, you end up with this weird sort of curving going on. So how the accuracy of it, I think there's a few issues. I think it's more like representation rather than feeling like oh, I've got something which I can work off and know that this distance is perfect. A few of these other just interesting um, things, this is the actual mesh. Um, which looks crazy to me for what it actually is. I don't know if you guys have ever used um, trees in models. I always remember like a 3D Max tree that it, it ended, up, ended up being, the tree was a bigger model than your entire project. Uh, so there looks to be you know, a bit of bloat there. And this is, should show us, and here's the different shots that we took. So that's these little cameras. So basically that's walking around the circle and giving you the perspective. And I think you can click on those, or maybe you can't, to show those perspectives. But that's, I didn't find that to be particularly useful. It was more like a novelty to go, okay, maybe you missed a section, or it's just kind of fun to see. Uh, so that's the successful model. Um, so small things, really small things seem to work as long as um, it's not shiny. So like I said, a cup like that will probably fail because it's perfectly round. So there's no reference points. Now, let me get out of this. Any questions on that? Yeah, how do you deal with scale? Um, obviously, you just have no scale for um, do, you, do you just scale it once you know, once you've got the model? And then there's a feature inside of the software which allows you to add reference points which I didn't use because I'm not using them anymore, so I didn't actually take it through that next stage. But once you've got the model, you, know, you can just scale it, as, as long as you've taken a measurement point on site. So, again, when you think about it, you're trying to scale a model, oh, like a sculpture, which again, is, that's where it really makes sense. Well, you need something like a straight line. So if it's on a plinth, well, you can measure the plinth, and that makes sense. What I didn't get, to, a chance to test was whether or not it's accurate in height. Well, my, I don't know what the maths is behind it, but I was wondering, could you use it as a tool? Let's say you were walking to an old church and you've got these huge vaulted ceilings, you don't have any existing drawings. Could you use this, take a few quick photos and figure out how high it is? Um, but again, why not just walk in with a laser measure and pick it a bit and know that it's perfectly accurate? That was my gut feeling. My, my whole process was thinking about where would I actually use it. Um, so let's documents. Uh, so what I've got here is a whole series of folders of these different scenarios. So we can jump to a few of them. Let's jump to uh, Bed Square. So anybody familiar with Bed, with Bed Square here? So this is the lecture theatre, the atrium, double glass wall, all these fractals everywhere. I was expecting it to fail miserably. Um, it actually did pretty well. Um, so we load up this model. But when I say it did pretty well, I don't think it's usable for much, but it looks kind of cool. Um, Uh, 
Uh, this also comes with uh, an iPad plugin and an iPhone plugin. And it actually looks better on the iPad. So it's, what it does on the iPad is it um, cuts away the mesh in front of you. So it figures out that you've got a box like this. So we can see the outside of it. That's not particularly useful. Um, on the iPad app, it sort of always eliminates that one face. So what we need to do here is sort of zoom in. And that's the Fair Square Atrium. Again, I, th I think what's happening here is as your volume becomes larger, you, you're, the amount of data you're capturing relative to the space of the si whole size of the space decreases. So small objects, huge amount of photos, lots of data. Box browning looks great. Big space like this, it's starting to just guess, blend things. Um, again, I, I call it uh, models on acid. They they look like there's some serious drugs going on, and again, I was trying to figure out what would you use this for, and uh, I'm not sure what you would use this one for. Any questions on that one? No? If you're doing um, the photos on low quality, so it works quicker, if you increase the quality, does the result increase the size? I tried a couple. It didn't seem to make a huge difference. The, I think the issue is it's so far away. So your camera is not really picking up much. So if you imagine doing that process when we're on the outside of the room, you're always the furthest away from the detail. So whereas when you do a small object and you're photographing like that, you're always focused as close as you can to the detail. So the, the subject or what you're trying to model makes a huge difference. Have you ever tried them like a street scape? Yeah, I've got some of those. Because I was thinking maybe what you could do is for facades, like yeah. old buildings. It's you quite could. interesting to use it for, for that, just for the existing context, so you have to model it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if so, you look for the use. So let's jump over to corner building. Here we go. Yeah. So that exact same principle. You can see the photos popping up. Uh, this is Little Collins in Melbourne. So old building. So, OK, let's see if we can model this. And the problem I found is it really depends on your context. Because as you're trying to go around in an arc, there's all trees, there's trams, there's all this stuff that gets in the way. And so the number of actual shots you can get drops. And so this one didn't get the full uh, shot every five or 10 degrees. And instead, there was probably gaps missing of 20 degrees. And I was wondering, will that work? And it, well, you'll see the results kind of. Again, it looks like it's on acid. Is it possible to do a number of these and stitch them together? And then, like, is that possible that you can put them in some kind of graphic model or whatever? I, I think if you had great skills, yeah. and I don't think it's so much rabbit skills, I'm thinking more like Rhino or something, yeah. if you're dealing with these weird shapes. Sure. Um, and you're able to melt it okay. But, so this is the end result. <laughs> so it looks like a can opener has been taken to the building. Um, which is kind of fun, but completely pointless. And what it failed to do was to see the little details of the windows. And that was because you're so far away and all the indents, they just you couldn't pick up on it. And instead what it's done is it's modeled like some trees which are in front of it, there's some vines. Um, and you think to yourself, well, why wouldn't I just take two still photos, model a box, and then map it over the top? It's probably faster and easier and looks. It might be easier. This is the stuff. Yeah, yeah, no, I think it is. I think that's the thing. I think once technology gets better, it's, that looks pretty cool. Um, so, anyway, that was corner building. So, as you can see, I had a, a week of um, quite a few failures. Um, <laughs> but it was kind of fun because you sort of start asking yourself, well, where, where does it fail? Um, so, Here's another example. I thought I'd go into a church, and what I was looking for is a dark environment. So does the photo that you take influence the model itself? So this is a church on Collins Street, um, vaulted ceilings, and this is the model, which turned out pretty well. This is where I was asking myself, could you use it to measure distances? And,
bigger the file size. Uh, this one's saying, telling me 7.8 megabytes. Uh, a lot of these are on um, either draft or standard resolution. There's higher levels that you can go. Yeah. The, all the online ones are at a lower uh, resolution. So this is our church. You can see how it sort of picks up bits and pieces of the information. Um, and that's because I was using that same process of being on the internals or inside, going around the outside edges. So as we sort of roam around, we can see that it hasn't done a bad job of picking up the bolts and things, but it's kind of missed everything behind the colonnade um, because there's no photos there. And it's, again, it's really hard to figure out what am I meant to be photographed. It, the more I did it, it seems to me to make far more sense to be using a laser than a photo to do this. The photo was convenient because we all cam carry cameras. Because yeah. um, the camera is, you have a, the fatal flaw of a camera is eventually, with the dynamic range, as soon as something gets too dark, you're no longer measuring data. It's just, rather than being able to look into the shadows, because there's something physically there, obviously, it's just said that that's absolute black, and vice versa. So it's, it's something really bright. So you can see the windows. All those windows at a uh, photography level is absolute white. Absolute white means no data. Same as black. You never really want either of those in, when you try to photograph something. Um, but again, interesting experiment. You know, what can you do with it? Now I'm just going to whip back to our I think we're fully uploaded here. So I'm just going to select all these files and then give it an action, create 3D model. So draft 15 minutes, standard 29. So we'll do a draft just to get it done quickly. To be honest with you, I didn't notice a whole lot of difference between the drafts and the um, standards, at least not on the web version. So let's call this in day out. Uh, there's a few extra setups in the advanced tools. Uh, I think it had more to do with these texture. I think you could pick textures if you, I think this is to do with shadows. Like, you'll find some things where it's actually mapped the shadow onto it. So I think you can control that. And there's also an area here where you can put in your measuring points. And that may actually be after you've done the model. But all of these, I'm just going to go Smith Project. And that'll just go away and it'll send me an email when that's finished rendering, which should be 15 minutes. So we'll jump back to just on the, on the left there you had four file formats that it could say to the RCS object. Uh, OBJ. So an object file. Yeah, I'll just let's do that again. is the RCS is what it's using on the web and then all the others like an object file you could download for your modeling. I think that's the, the process there. Okay, so if we go back here, 
So some of the other ones that I attempted to try was there's a bridge in Melbourne. I thought it was a complicated bridge. This is the second one I I had done before. I had figured out that this would completely not work. Um, but if we have a look at one of these images, one of the big issues is there's all this stuff in the background and it's struggling to figure out whether or not that's part of the model or not part of the model. And it seemed to be able to pick up on buildings in the background better than the actual focal subject, um, which is really bizarre. It's like suddenly there'd be just a snippet of a hotel, but it's failed to um, show you the bridge at all. And we sound up around very slowly now. Anyway, that's a preview of it on the side there. Completely failed. Just it, the model was ridiculous. It's sort of when you open it up, it's got these random little <coughs> bits of data of I don't even know what it was, so complete failure there. But that was a lesson because what I learned is when you take a photograph of something, and we'll go to this sculpture, which I thought was actually a reasonable success, um, if you can get as much blue sky in that shot as you can, the better it's going to work. So let's jump over to Bird. So you're saying the background photo gets in the way. Yeah. So if you, you can take a photo, let's say you've got a sculpture, and you're aiming up, you've got blue sky, it's almost like a blue screen. And it's, I think it's very easy for it to tell that, I'm, I'm guessing here that they even go against map pink blue there, we're going to guess that it's a sky and not an, an object. So this is an example of uh, a big bird sculpture in Melbourne. It's down at Docklands. Anyone familiar with that bird? Anyway, it's this huge big sculpture there. Um, I've roamed around, taken the photos, looking up, because this thing's on a huge big plinth, so it's well above my head. Um, but it's all open, because it's not surrounded by buildings directly, even though there's buildings in the distance, because of the angle, you can get rid of all the clutter. And the model that it produced was this one. small models and you remove shadows so you maybe have a turntable that moved your small object around and you kept your camera still that you get better results. You could do that as well. I mean like this model, I mean I'm pretty impressed by this, by the texture, but the problem is it's probably too well done. Because suddenly you've got this model that you've imported and if it takes the mapping with it, which is you know a hundred times more detailed than most of the rest of your building. So does it match anymore or not sure. But this is what the outcome was here. And this one has shadows. But what you can see is it didn't have any data for the head. So you're kind of stuck going, well, is that a success or not a success? Can I take that into another program and finish off the model myself? Or does this look really dodgy <coughs> with this you know, simplistic shape on top? But again, if you had a little helicopter or something where you could get it up high enough to model it, Yep, but then you're back to the same process of, well, does this mean you're going to hire a consultant to go and model a sculpture for you, or is it even worth it? Like, why am I putting that time into it rather than just getting on with the design? I don't know, that's my, my practical mind going. I like it, I think it's powerful, but... Yeah, the images follow a sequential order like you did in the room. Yeah. If you mix that order up, yeah. would it still be able to make the model? I think it can. I wasn't sure about that. Um, but from what I'm guessing, it, I, I think because you can, for example, you go around in a sequence and then suddenly you jump up to the top. I think it can still figure that out. But at the same time, it's telling you that if you're using your iPhone and you're going snap, 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 that you should have, I think they were saying 50% coverage. So why you need coverage on that? and not the other stuff I don't know. So.
One thing is, if you had a drone that took a, say, an overhead shot of a building, but the drone may not follow the sequential order that you kind of did going around the room. It might be a little bit more haphazard, and I'm curious to see how it stitched that together. There's a YouTube clip um, of a guy who's been doing that. I think he, what was he? No, he was in a helicopter. So he's flying around a big building, so he wanted to model, let's say, a hospital very quickly. Jumped in a helicopter, flying around, and the results look like he's got a decent model. But again, you sort of ask yourself, you're at such a height, the quality of the model, surely you can whip up a few blocks and make it look like you know, the hospital faster than hiring a helicopter, you know, going up there with a camera, then coming back down, importing it all. By the time you do all that stay and day, you probably have already done that in an hour. Um, so again, but see sculptures make sense to me because here's something that's very difficult to model and it's a relatively accurate uh, mesh. So that's the bird. That was one of the closest uh, successes I had. Let's see what else we've got. We've got a couple couple more and then we'll be back to our one for today, I think. Bird, 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 bridge, box branch, church, we've done that. I am the parking meter. So again, this was sort of looking at, could you use it for small objects? And what are the small objects that would make sense? So if you were really wanting to get a look, like a presentation style, um, then you might want to go model a parking meter to make it look real. When, but I, when I was doing all of this, what I felt like it was a bit like a computer game. Like if you were doing mapping for a game or a movie, maybe you want to go to all of this and get that accuracy. But in architecture, I just didn't feel like it was worth it. One of the problems we have when we're trying to capture a building, particularly photographs, is trying to get a measurement where we don't have the ability to measure it. Yeah. And it's possible that by doing that, then find some way of scaling the mesh so you get some reasonable attempt at a decent measurement yep. in inaccessible areas. Yep, I, I agree. I think that's a usable. It's like the church. Like the church is slightly different, but the, the model might be giving you a rough arc. So if you didn't know what that arc was, well, you can use this mesh to at least give you a very rough point, which you then model off. How, how does it work in landscape, like an open field? Or I think, I think our open spaces would work better. Yeah, because that, that would be another good use when you don't have time to get there to the beach survey. You can just um, take some photos of the paddock and then... Depending on what, as long as you can focus on something, it needs to have a subject. So if you had a building in a paddock, well, you sort of go around the building, and I think that would do a pretty decent job. Yeah. If you wanted to go the opposite way to get the paddock, I don't really, it's what you're really doing there is stitching together a huge panorama. Yeah. And you probably do that better with, you know, that globe technique and map. So, you, so if you put like a few props in the landscape, perhaps it can help. It might be able to do it. Again, it's all about how much data you can get. You can see that we modeled one room and we went through, I think, uh, 60 photos. And even then, what my guess is from the one that we just did, all the low level data, so anything over with your feet might be modelled because it couldn't see that. Um, anything underneath the tables won't be modelled. Um, anything above the projector might be modelled. So there's all these areas where, because of where the cam camera angle is, just it won't work. Um, but this is the parking meter, and again, it's pretty cool. I mean, if you cut away all the, you know, the can opener sort of background. It's not bad, but if you zoom in, what you find is a lot of the edges are quite round. It failed to model the stuff underneath it. Um, and again, I, I think my gut feeling is I'd rather model that for myself and then map over the top of it. But, um, but it, it, interesting experiment, and definitely, I think there's going to be a lot of work in this area. And 
again, I think if you've got it for self to do it. And they, obviously I picked up this software two weeks ago, gave it a try, to see if it was one of those useful tools that anybody could do. And at the moment, my gut feeling is it's still a consultant's game. And they're going to be, they'll charge a fee, they'll know that they need to have maybe a electron helicopter or a real helicopter to get a certain scene. Uh, and then you can weigh up whether or not that cost is worth the model that you get back. But, uh, yeah, but interesting. I, don't, I think the, um, the big change will be when it becomes something you can use on your iPhone even more, and where it's showing you the model that it's creating in a live format so you can sort of walk around and also when it starts to use the GPS data for photos. So the new DSLRs which are coming out have GPS built in, the phone already um, can do that. And then it knows where your photo has been taken from all the time rather than trying to do maths to figure it out. I think that would be pretty fascinating. So I'm still waiting for this email. Do we have any questions? See that maybe you'd be able to use it for taking um, physical conceptual models into a digital world. Yeah, that would be like the Gary models. That would be, be quite difficult to transfer. Actually, that's a perfect use of it. And that's where you know you're round board, no shadows, and just using it even just as a base model to then work off. Because yeah. you can't compete with scanners on big scale. No, but yeah, you know, for anyone doing that sort of work and they don't want to spend a lot of money bringing it in, I think that would be perfect. Um, so um, let's go back and see where we're going. Any questions as we wait for this model to finish rendering? Uh, am I being completely negative with the software? Or <laughs> well, one advantage I see in it is that um, often when you Modeling something that's being built, particularly the mapping aspect of it. You know, you can eye drop colors, get an idea of what the actual color was inside something or outside something. So it can help in certain areas where you're trying to, even if you remodel something, capture some of the data and transfer it across. Yeah, I think it's going to have lots of uses. It's just figuring out what we can use it for and just understanding where it's not working so well just yet. And then I think what would be great is if you had a camera, like more like a Google car camera, Google Maps, and you walk in a room, and it takes a 360 degree shot straight away, you walk over to that side of the room, take another 360 degree shot, take a few of those at different locations, and then suddenly you get a model. I think that would be completely brilliant. And if you knew that it was accurate, because it, my sense here was I couldn't trust the model, because it couldn't go into the edges, and, so it was, looked pretty, but it was lacking lacking accuracy. So, but maybe you test it and you go, okay, it finds the four edges pretty well, the corners aren't accurate, and you can trust a few measurements. And, but again, I think there's some more, more testing to be done there. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Do you know of any other similar services? Yeah, I think there's a few. I didn't test those. I just used this one because yeah. it's free. But I heard Google were developing their own because that's why they uh, like a bit of sketch up because they're going to start doing this to scan cities and then put that in their maps. Yeah. They've got a match photo thing and sketch up there that allows you to take shot and paste it onto it. Yeah. Three D models. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. generate, but it's not something I meant to generate. It's fine. Yeah. So it's more like mapping. And well, it's also for figuring out your perspectives. Is that right? Yeah. So it knows where you want to was. Yeah. No, this is in addition to that. Yeah. There are other companies who are doing it. Um, and the story I heard is that the reason it's free at the moment is because it's being tested. And you'll see when we go to the first model, what first pops up is, was this a success or did this uh, crash and burn? Do, do Autodesk um, put up any exemplars of like a crash result? They've got a really good YouTube video explaining how to use the software, and then there's a couple uh, clips from other people showing what they've done with it. What, what sort of subjects were they? Uh, they were this aerial shot, so he was in a helicopter, roamed around, 
and the auto desk one, they've got some examples in it, but it's always a success story. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, this stuff is so brilliant, you just sort of, like I sort of mentioned. These one I prepared earlier. Yeah. <laughs> like it sort of, it does it really well, it shows you how to do the process, same as what we did. Um, but then at the end, it sort of says the one where you can just paste these images together with your phone and it's going to work. And I just didn't find that to be true. It's, it just, you can't figure out, you can't, it's really hard to stitch together that many photos. So if you wanted to do that in a panorama with a big camera, you have to buy this thing called a Giga, what's it called? The Giga Photo. And it's a mechanical device which moves several degrees, takes a photo and then uh, stitches together you know, 50 to 100 images. So trying to do a handhold without the guide that you've got on your phone, just too hard. Any other questions? No? I was, I'll just say that, onto your question, but when I've, I have tried it, and um, it did have some sample files within Autodesk 360 with all the photos already taken. That was about 250 photos of an alligator just sitting on the grass. Right. Uh, so I stitched that and that came out really well. So they've obviously put in the ones that work perfect. Yeah. It's like you say, when you've got a sky behind, you can have the grass behind. Yeah. But that worked, um, that worked really well. So there are a few examples um, on the website. A, a little frustrating thing that I found was, you sort of go, if I take more photos, I'll get a better result. And then you hit this 250 photo limit. So you've just gone out on site, you've walked around, you've tried to do this really well, and then suddenly you've got to select how to cull the photos. Um, so, again, it's just a little bit frustrating. Oh, here we go. Are you satisfied with the results? Uh, no. Um, and we'll just, well, let's see what we've got. So this is our space. Um, now this could be, it's interesting all your faces here on the side of the wall. <laughs> now, this could be because I'm doing it wrong. I mean, maybe there's a simpler way of doing it, maybe there's a, a better way of doing it. But again, I'm following the Autodesk instructions and it's worked for some rooms. Like, this is exactly the same process that was used for Fed Square or the, uh, the church. And this is a really simple room. This is a box, but obviously it's got a lot of heads in here. And all the walls are the same colour. Yeah, I just... But interestingly, see how it's sort of picked up on the projector? And it's tried to... It's tried to model it, because it can see it as an object. But all the people are just freaked out on um, And it's also... I mean, thinking about accuracy of sizes, I mean, that room it doesn't exist like that at all. So... Yeah, but I'm... <laughs> there also wasn't enough contrast in the desks and the computers to put it to the... Um... There was a lot of black. So what was happening is the top photo, quite bright. When I... Because on this camera I can take a perfectly parallel shot uh, down below. So when I moved it down, a lot of you are black. So your chairs are black and you've all got shadows underneath your chairs. So those second shots were struggling. The other thing that it's doing is, each one of you is almost an object of your own, but I haven't gone around all of you. I've, I've gone around the group, but I haven't actually circled you. So you probably make an entire model just like that. Are we done? Yeah, we're yeah. about done here. <laughs> yeah, I think we all done. Oh, thank good, you very much. Uh, thank you for joining uh, Nick again, Randy's. Um, we'll be having some snacks sponsored by Trimble. Just downstairs. Oh, okay.